Welcome back to War Season House. Michael Russo, Anthony LaPanta. Welcome to the Aquarius Home Services Studio. And speaking of Aquarius, Anthony, this morning I had my uh, the water guys out today to to take care of my Connecticut water filters like they do once a year and check out the water softener. You'll be happy to know everything's going well. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I'm, now I can relax. I'll yeah, be able so to I, sleep a little better tonight. I know you were worried, uh, especially when you were on the golf course today with about 17 Hall of Famers. It wasn't uh, that Tell something. about your day. Yeah, it was. Well, it, I've had some great golf over the last few days and over the weekend I went up and I was thinking about this yesterday, went up to Brainerd for the weekend for, I think it was either 20 or 24 guys. I can't remember for sure, but it's all guys I went to high school with or almost all there's two guys from a class ahead of me, one guy, one class behind my younger brother, Steve plays who's four classes behind. So there's those four, Mm -hmm. there's two outliers who have come in as subs over the years. The other 14 or 18 guys Mm -hmm. have known each other for 40 years. Crazy. We went to high school together, class of 86 at Totino Grace. So the fall of 82, we started and we've been doing this golf tournament or a form of it most years in Brainerd since just after college. So 30 plus years. And it was pretty amazing when you sat around dinner tables and fires, bonfires, and to think that this group of guys has known each other for 40 years. So that was fun. And I was reflecting on that as I was driving home from Brainerd the other morning. And then today I went and played, and this is the second time we've had kind of an across the board Bally's Sports North group mm-hmm. where it's guys from the different sports. And it's a lot of fun to get together. I cross paths with all of those guys, but they don't cross paths with each other. So the basketball crew with the hockey crew with the baseball crew, it's fun just to hear those guys talk about their stories as players, but also as broadcasters. Now, what's it like covering their team, dealing with their coaches, the protocol on the road, all that kind of stuff. And it's so much fun, but Today, I was, well, I'll start it with the vote of confidence I got from my wife before I left because she made sure to remind me as I was leaving, now, who are you playing with today? And I told her and she said, okay, well, now just remember, most of those guys were pro athletes and you weren't. (laughs) And it's like, well, thanks for the vote of confidence, Margo. I'll go do my best. But did she also tell you to be on your best behavior? No, just one. I think it was more about managing my expectations and just be prepared to get your ass kicked today and know that they're better than you. And so we went and played and it was a tremendous group. And when we were done and I was, it was when I was driving home and I had snapped a couple pictures with their group and I started thinking about who I was playing with. And in my first group is Mike Madano. Yeah. How did he wind up in it? He's not Bally's. Well, he's not Bally's, but he's, he's connected with the wild and with us. Uh And he had asked if he could play. We actually had Ryan Carter, Glenn Perkins, and Mark Parrish all had to drop out at the last minute for different reasons. So we had a spot. We were going to have 10. We had seven. So we got one more to get to eight. But so Mike Madano and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking about it. He's probably one of the top two American born NHL players of all time. Yeah. Him and Patrick Kane, maybe. I was thinking he and Brett Hall. Yeah. Those are probably the... Brett Hall's not American born though. Well, I thought he was American born, but then grew up in Canada. For no, I think he was... Canadian. I think he was born in Canada. Okay. Because well, I always refer to Mike Madano as being the number one American US born born. scorer. Okay. And technically I, always, and I thought Hall was technically than. born in Chicago, but then grew up in Canada. So he could have, I, either yeah. way, bottom line is I was thinking maybe Chelios, maybe Housley, maybe Kane, but mm-hmm. Madano's certainly one of the top, let's say top three. Right. And then we've got Justin Morneau, who for sure top three, maybe top two Canadian-born major league player of all time. Right. I mean, Larry Larry Walker, Walker. Joey Votto, maybe the only two. Mm -hmm. Jim Peterson's in the group. Yeah. And I start thinking about, all right, how about Minnesota-born NBA players? Kevin McHale. And after him, it's probably Jim Peterson. Right. And Oberding had a great career, but he was better than guys. He he did more in the NBA than guys like Randy Brewer. And he's probably the second best Minnesota-born NBA player. Second most accomplished. And then you get slugs like Wes Walls, who all he did was captain the Minnesota Wild, and Tim Laudner, who was a world champion with the Twins. It's quite a group yes. when you think about yeah. it. And for me, what a thrill to get to play with these guys. And and we had a couple of I assume Madonna kicked everybody's ass? No, actually, Madonna came in last. No way. He did. I mean, his team, it was a partner event. 
and he was the was partner. His, you? No, his partner was, <laughs> I was Justin Morrow's partner and we won actually today, but Tim Laudner was a low handicap guy in the group and Madonna was the second lowest. I think he was the same as Morno, but everybody in the group was between a three and a 10 handicap. So they're all pretty good players. He was partners with Jim Den, who's our sales manager at Bally Sports North. And Justin Morno and I beat them in the semifinals. And then we beat Wes Walls and Tony Tortorici, our executive producer in the championship match. And Laudner and Jim Peterson beat... Madonna and Jim Den in the third place match. Wow. So it was, but Madonna, we were giving Madonna some grief because he eagled the last hole of the front nine. And so the first match, semifinal match was the front nine. He eagled the last to get to one over par for the front, but Morno and I beat him. So as the next group's coming up in the cart and they said, hey, who won? And I said, well, we clipped him and said, Madonna shot one over, but you know, we beat him. <laughs> and, and it was just, I mean, he, he's, he is a good player. And really all of those guys are good players. And to Margot's point, pro athletes are just different. They're just wired differently. Yeah. Like he hit a ball. I think it would have been on the second of the last hole on the front. At Winsong. At Winsong. Like tr- terrific course. And he hit a ball into the weeds. So he has to take a penalty stroke. He drops and sticks one from 130 yards to six feet and makes a par even with a penalty stroke. And it's just little things like that. Like when the game is on the line and at that point we were up two with two to play and he knew he had to win the last couple holes. And it's like, he just, okay, we'll just drop one here and stick it tight and beat you. And they all just kind of have that in them. Wes Walls did the same thing today. He had hit a ball in the in the weeds in our championship match. He was frustrated. He knew his back was to the wall. Well, he gets up and down by making like a 40 foot putt just to keep himself in the match. It's mm-hmm. just when, when something has to happen, pro athletes have yeah. the ability to do it. And it's, but it was so much fun and it's just a, a tremendous group. And for me, like to just step back from what I do for a living for a minute to say that I grew up watching Mike Madonna play from with the Minnesota North stars. I was, nah. I watched Wes Walls play when I was a, just a fan of the Minnesota wild. I was, of course with Tim Laudner, I was Jim Peterson. Like I watched play for the Gophers. I mean, these are guys that to some degree were, I don't, I don't necessarily say that heroes is my right word, but they were guys of whom I was an avid fan. And now I'm just going out and playing 18 holes with them and, sitting down having lunch afterward and and just BSing about life. It it was pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds like a great day. Um and that is that is the cool part of our our jo- both our jobs is we've get we get to hang with people that in a lot of cases, especially at our ages now, that we actually grew up uh you know right. watching. And I've always know, said and, like I'm not I, I'm more odd. I, I don't have an awe of athletes yeah. and I think I I sometimes get I don't for, I don't know what the right word is, but you sometimes get like immune to it, cold to it, just because you watch it every day. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm more odd. I always tell people by like musical talent Same. blows my mind. Yeah. And, but you do have to remember just how special what these guys are able to do really is. And for me, those are the, like, I don't have a, I don't have an autograph in my possession. I don't have mm-hmm. a piece of memorabilia. I don't, but those days where now I get to go and experience something like yeah. this, where you're, you're just hanging out as, Co-workers and friends, that's pretty special. Yeah. Funny enough, the only two autographs I have is uh, Mike Madano because he autographed a uh, at when they wrote the number nine book when it, we were at the game where his number was nine was put up in the rafters of American Airlines Center. Um, he, he delivered a book to my, uh, my uh, table. And uh, had an autograph in there, and then uh, and then Dino Cicerelli, his six uh, hundredth goal with the Florida in the NHL was with the Florida Panthers, and we had a front page picture the next day um, in the in the Sun Sentinel, and he came up to me at practice and said, "Is anyway you can get me that on a glossy?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll get two though," <laughs> <laughs> and it's the only autograph I ever asked, especially from a player while I was covering him, and uh, but it was just like, and it's one of those things, still a keepsake, like it, w- it wasn't meant to be sold, you right. know, it's just sitting, it's basically sitting in a drawer in my house but the it's only neat. the only autograph that i've i mean as a kid i got some autographs but the only autograph that i have asked for as an adult was hank aaron mm-hmm. and i was covering the twins on the wow. radio back in the late 90s and i walked into our hotel the fister hotel in milwaukee <laughs> haunted yeah, haunted exactly and as i walked in the lobby there was hank aaron he was in town wow. for some kind of autograph thing or whatever but at this time he's just sitting in a chair in the lobby. Yeah. 
And I walked over to him and I actually signed it on a Fister bar napkin. Yeah. But I thought it would be cool for AJ, who was at the time like five years old and a just growing baseball fan. And so I got the, I have no idea if we still have it, but that's the only autograph yeah. I've asked it's a, for. It's as a an good adult. autograph to ask, especially as an adult. Uh, it's funny that you said uh, like a hotel lobby, just running into somebody. I vividly remember I'm as a kid and, and it's funny because I'm rewatching West Wing and there's a scene that takes place at the Sheridan Universal. And I remember as a kid staying at that hotel with my parents. Uh, it was like my, like when I turned 13, we went on a trip to California, a baseball trip where we went to a Dodgers game in Oakland. A's game and a San Diego Padres game. And we're walking into the hotel and Telly Savalas is walking out of that hotel. And I'm like, that's Kojak. And, you know, I just remember that. And I went up to him and I, I, I didn't have anything to get an autograph, but I shook his hand. He had no finger. He was like missing a finger. Really? And I'll never forget that as long as what I live. What scene in the out. West Wing was in that hotel? Is that when they were out they there were, for the election? They were out there. It was, in, uh, it was season one. Because uh, it was definitely season one because uh, I'm only on the first season oh, right now. So Margo just went and found best wishes to AJ, Hank Aaron, wow. on the Fister piece of paper. That's really fun. Where'd you find that? Just in the garbage can? Yeah, she, right? yeah. she keeps uh, our stuff organized around I covered here. a Marlins uh, Brewer series and I stayed at that Fister hotel. And while we were staying there, um, the next morning, um, I find out that Alex Gonzalez and Louis Castillo played for the Marlins. They checked out of the hotel because they were convinced that their hotel oh, there was like there their was radiator some, right. or something. There was were going some on. great stories about practical jokes. Some of the twins coaches played on uh-huh. there. Were, they had a couple coaches and Jerry White, I remember was a part of the staff when I was there and he would sometimes sleep in the lobby because he was scared. His room was haunted, but the same was the Vinoy. The in Vonoy Tampa, in St. Pete, yeah. In, in St. Pete. St. Pete. The Pink Hotel. Yes. And the, that one, too, is supposedly haunted. Yep. So there are a lot of great stories about games and jokes that Twins yeah. players have played on each other yep. for guys that thought those hotels were haunted. Yeah. Like writing messages on the mirror and soap. Yep. So as soon as they'd take a shower, yep. it, their name would come up on the mirror. And <laughs> That's it was, hilarious. Yeah, there were some pretty yep. good ones for what guys yep. did there. But anyway, the I was trying to think of the, what in season one, when did they go to the- uh, uh, they they were out in California for something. I can't remember. They were out there. They remember they they flew out there because he had, it was like a day in the life of the president. He had all this stuff that he was doing out in California, and he flew at three a.m. on the on the. On uh, on Air Force One oh, and made yeah, and the they, press and go they out there. Talked about that. Would, right. Wouldn't it have been great if we were just chasing the sun or exactly. something like that? And right. that's exactly the first scene of the the show. And that was the one like Sam Seaborn wrote a uh, wrote some speech that he wanted the press to give back. And you know Danny Kincaid it was right. Yep, it's I funny because that. I I, was, I, I ate show. at Scopa, which you and I and Margo have eaten at before. And I was eating at Scopa like three years ago. And I'm in the uh, I'm there and I'm eating alone. And all of a sudden, I look over there. I'm like, "Holy crap! That's the actor that played Danny Kincannon, the, uh, oh, really? the reporter in, in the West Wing." So, um, last thing on autographs, and then we'll get to the show. Um, so, two nights ago, my brother goes, takes his youngest son, to, uh, Liam, to the Braves game. Uh, they're playing the Mets. My brother is a diehard Mets fan. Obviously, now his kids are impressionable. They have to be a diehard Mets fan. And they have a bad loss. But my brother during the game meets uh, Vientos, uh, his dad and his brother, and they hit it off. And they're sh- he's showing him videos of my of Liam's swing and everything and, and all this stuff. And so after the game, Charles, the dad, Vientos' dad, brings Liam and my brother. They're like, we're going to ha- have you meet my son after the game. They have no idea, though, that somehow Vientos' dad gets them onto the field, which shocked me because, you know, I don't care who it is. Like you can meet Todd Boldy tomorrow, but Boldy's not going to be able to get you downstairs to meet Matt Boldy. Matt's going to, you know, but anyway, now my brother's got a video of Liam walking up to Vientos and Charles, the dad saying like, this is my baby to Vientos and Vientos hit a homer that game too. And autographed, they're taking pictures on the field, everything. It was really cool. So that says everything about that guy. Yeah. And I've got a a story of that I don't know anything about this, but I saw it on social media the other day, which you know that you know how often I'm just scrolling through random mm-hmm. videos that I thought I saw just the opposite. So there's this guy. It was when Michigan played Texas mm-hmm. in college football, and the Texas quarterback, I think his name is Quinn Ewers, yeah, and he's been there forever. Good, great quarterback. He's walking across the field, and so somehow this guy who's a Michigan fan had a field pass, and he's got his son with him. His son's like maybe 10. 
and they flag yours down. Who's in his Texas uniform, and he asks the guy, "Can I get? Can we get a picture?" So uh, yours, to his credit, the guy, kids wearing all Michigan stuff. He says, "Sure." So he puts his arm around this kid, and the dad, as he's taking the picture, signals to his kid to put the horns down because you know all the Texas fans mm-hmm. use the horns up thing. So yours in the picture has got his horns up, and the dad like signals to the kid, like horns down. And so the kid does it. And I'm just thinking, you know what, what a spoiled prick. Yeah. You've some, you're 10 years old. And this is the lesson that you're being taught is you got this guy who's about to play a football game, a big game too. Both teams are ranked in the top five. And this quarterback is gracious enough to stop. And instead of showing him the respect, your dad is telling you to here, act like a in this picture yeah. just to show this guy up. And as yours just walks away, he just kind of shakes his head and you just think, well, good for you, not for like saying anything. And But what a terrible example for this dad who's, you know, who knows, he's maybe some donor or something that is all allowed to get down on the field for this. And this is the way you show the respect to an athlete that's mm-hmm. willing to take the time to take a picture with your kid yeah. right before he's playing a game. I'm pretty sure that's the first swear word you've ever said on this podcast. Prick. Oh, said, dick. Now I said it twice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now we gotta. Well, now I gotta. Our poor producers in Italy. <laughs> I gotta text them to take out this word four times. And really, minute. is that considered a swear I think word? It you is. think? I think it is. Or should we just not tell him? I wouldn't tell him. I'm, I'm okay actually, with Actually, this it. will be a test to see if Davide <laughs> actually listens to the pod. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, and he's in Italian, so it'll be translated anyway. Yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about the show real quick, and then we'll go to break. Then we'll, re- I mean, the team real quick, then we'll go to break, and then we'll really talk about the team. Uh, 17 minutes, everybody uh, that was nice enough to listen to this. October 2nd is our next live show. That's at Elsie's. Uh, we might even have a, li- uh, a special guest for that show. So October 2nd, 7 p.m. at Elsie's. That's next Wednesday night. Uh, uh, you said you were available that night. You yeah, me it looks like you might not be. I was just thinking, I thought October 2nd was the Tuesday night that we were doing the wild game. So no, October seconds wednesday yeah all right i'm in all right good all right (laughs) next wednesday night october 2nd um is uh our next live show at lc's and then october 30th at split rocks the day that we get back from uh pittsburgh from that seven game road trip so it's really cool because the october 2nd show the wild have have played three straight um all three of their home exhibition games and and what will be neat about that is we'll finally get to see um all the veterans the only veterans or the only nhl regulars that so far we've seen in any games are um declan chisholm um, and let's be honest, he could be in and out. Um, Marco Rossi, Murat, who's in DNF last night, uh, Johnny Merrill, who's probably going to be the seventh D and I think, and ya- Jakob Lacco. We haven't seen anybody else. I don't think, uh, yet an exhibition game. So by then we're going to have Gus, a really good like Gus. Yeah. And Gus. Um, and what do you think of Gus last night? I thought early I was concerned and it, there's just something he loses track of pucks that get deflected frequently. And that was, I thought, one of his big problems last year. And mm-hmm. that early deflection that went off Marco Rossi's stick, it didn't seem like it should have taken that long to find where that puck went. It was yeah. a deflection from a long way away. And I, I'm not a goaltending expert, so I, the mechanics of it are way beyond me. But there's just something about the way he slides across the crease, and it's like his head goes earlier than most other goalies or something. So as soon as that happened, I was concerned. Then the he... I didn't really love the wrist shot goal he gave up to Haskinen. But after that, I thought he looked terrific. I thought he he moved laterally really well. I thought for the most part, he controlled rebounds. He made some really good saves and had zero support in front of him. I thought the, the team, especially in the first period, it felt like it could have been five zip and instead it was only two. So it was, I thought he was, I thought he was pretty good. I just, the first maybe five, six minutes I, it was a little concerning, but after that, I thought he looked pretty good. And then good. he made some brilliant saves. That was really um, good. You know, even the, the Mason Marshman goal, which a lot of people on Twitter uh, were ripping on, I mean, that was a great, like, play. I mean, uh, you know, and, and let's be honest, the Wild gave up a two-on-one. If anybody's to be blamed on that shift, probably Marco Rossi. I mean, just totally lost in his own end. Um, and so, like, uh, you know, I, I didn't I, – I thought – Second goal, he's got four bodies in front of him. First goal, weird deflection. You're right. Um, I still don't really blame him on that. First game. Yeah, not, and then, I don't say that was blame yeah. him. I just think it's a there's something about the way he reacts to those pucks that when you compare it to other goaltenders, 
I think it, there's a concern there. It, mm-hmm. It's he loses track of the puck on some deflections from long range right. more quickly and more often than right. a lot of goaltenders do. Um, and and the, the only thing I'll say because everybody was going off on Twitter on a couple, and it, it was not a very good game. And and let's do this. Let's take a break, and then we'll really get into the game and into training camp. But uh, you know. This is what the preseason is for. Like, you know, I, I know, look, it's a young lineup last night. They're playing an incredible team. It, it's tough. Um, but this is like, yeah, yeah. Like, was Rossi good? No. Was Hussein Dinov good? No. Declan was not as good as he was in Winnipeg by any stretch. But this is what the preseason is for. You want it to happen now. Um, you know, this is most of their first games. Um, so uh, the, 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 the problem is, is that, it's not like it used to be when I first started covering the league and training camp was like 28 days, you know, training. I mean, the season's right around the corner. So you just got to get these, these, these bugs out of your system. Let's do this. Let's take a quick break. Hey, it's Russo for Aquarius Home Services. The mega sale is here and Aquarius is offering an amazing two for one AC and furnace tune up special with the unpredictable weather. Your AC has been working overtime and colder temperatures are on the way for one low price. Aquarius will thoroughly evaluate your entire heating and cooling system, ensuring you're prepared for every season. Don't wait. Schedule your appointment now at AquariusHomeServices.com. Aquarius earning the right to be recommended. And remember, tell them that Russo sent you. Get $250 when you switch to a Royal Credit Union checking account. Switch to Royal's Smart Checking Account and enjoy no monthly fees or minimum balance, free mobile check deposits, and surcharge-free access to over 40,000 ATMs nationwide. Getting your $250 is easy. Open your Royal Checking Account by October 19, receive two payroll direct deposits, and you'll receive $250. See details and open your account today at rcu.org slash checking bonus. Insured by NCUA. Back here, work seats in the house. Michael Russo, Anthony LaPanta. October 2nd is our next live show at LC's. October 30th, then at Split Rocks. Both shows at 7 p.m. Might have a special guest uh, for both of them. We'll see. Uh, we'll uh, pay attention to uh, social media and you'll be able to find that out. And, uh, you know, Anthony will retweet it, maybe. Um, guaranteed on October Just 2nd, you will text me, me asking, oh, tonight at Tuttles? Tonight, yeah. Um, so let's go back to the game. Um, one other concern that I, that I was a little stunned at is is I didn't think a lot of the prospects had good games. Um, Ogren and Hyde, well, I didn't especially. think any of them did. Yeah. And it, it, I thought Lauko looked good. I thought Hunter Haight looked decent. But those are the opportunities for those guys to prove that they can play with NHL players. Yeah. And <laughs> yes, they were going up against a good Dallas team. But if you want to be in the NHL, that's who you're going to face. Yeah. You're not going to face Dallas's fifth and sixth lines that are going to end up in their American Hockey League situation. So uh, if I were some of those guys, and Wes and I talked about it on the broadcast last night, this is your chance. If you think Riley Height or Liam Ogren or any of those other guys, if you want to show that you are ready to be in the NHL right now, this is your chance to do it. And it's more than whether or not you score. It's just looking the part. And I didn't think any of those guys did. I thought I thought the whole team looked slow and a little heavy legged. We wondered if maybe that was a uh, hitting is, a wall it, yeah. in training camp. It's been yeah. an intense camp. It's been an intense breaks. camp. And, and I do think that it's one thing to fly to Winnipeg on the day of the game, as you know, and I, nobody, I know, I don't want to do the old common, like, oh, with these poor professional athletes, but a two and a half hour flight, especially yeah. for Gustafson, it's you know, a goalie, easy. a two and a half hour flight where you're landing at 430 before a 7 p.m. game, it can't be easy to get off that no. plane, especially as a goalie in play. And they had their morning skate here yep. first. So it's, yeah, it's not easy. And, 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 and again, and, the, like what's weird about it is like you have a morning skate at 10 a.m. and then usually you go back to the hotel, you get your afternoon nap in, but these guys are off the ice at 11, but then they're just sitting around waiting for the 2 p.m. flight. You know, it's it's just, it's it takes the routine away. And there is some, there's a difference between yeah. going and taking a nap somewhere and getting on an airplane and flying for two and a half hours. Yes. And you and I have joked for years that the NHL schedule makers, I think, think that Dallas is like yeah. a suburb of St. Paul the number of times that the wild play back to backs either Dallas and home or home and then to Dallas it's a two and a half hour flight yeah and so it's a long day yeah, I will just to one thing because I've gotten this question a lot of people have commented on ripping on the league for putting them in Dallas just so you, everybody knows out there exhibition schedules are done by teams so like the wild set this up they could have gone the night before they they just right. this is how they and do all it. the team so, it, and the outcome of yeah. the game doesn't matter so yeah. there is there aren't 
I don't know of any teams that are flying the night before. No, I've never heard the, it in the exhibition yeah. season. And to be fair, I mean, it doesn't it doesn't matter. So, yeah. but I'm just saying, throwing that out as a possibility to excuse a little bit of what looked like a really heavy legged. Yeah team in the first period. I thought they came out better in the second, but none of those guys, in my opinion, did enough to change what I think the opinion is. That is Liam Olgren and Riley Height both probably need to start the season in Iowa. Yeah. Riley has to go back to juniors or, so. and, and that, or start the season yeah. somewhere other than the national hockey league that Marat Husnadinov is, is probably a fourth line guy. He, I, I don't think any of those guys did enough in mm-hmm. last night's game to say, Let's give this guy another look and see, because keep in mind, so many of these guys, it's put your name on the top of the list for when somebody's needed from Iowa and not, there's a long way to go before that happens. And there's the start of the American Hockey League season is going to dictate that too. But this is your chance to show it in front of the NHL coaches. And if I were the wild scouting staff, I would have looked at last night's game saying that none of these guys did anything to move the needle. Yeah. Uh, the one guy that I did think was very noticeable last night is Hunter Hayde, who's starting his pro career uh, in Iowa. Um, you know, obviously had a really quality junior career, um, really fascinating guy. I think his dad's a um, staff sergeant in the OPP. And, you know, like, uh, you know, there's there's a lot to like about this guy. And, and he is watching him in practice, too. He is nifty with that puck. Yeah, I mean, he, he showed some, some speed last night. He, is, he does some crazy crazy puck handling stuff with his stick that that is uh, pretty special. And I thought he showed some speed, looked good. And then the other guy that's had a really fabulous camp, both in practice and now two exhibition games with two goals is, is Lauko. Uh, you know, traded in the Vinny Letary trade. He's never been a big scorer in the league, but finally, you know, becomes more of a full-time player, starting a PK as well, second goal in two games, and he looked good last night. He did, and what's interesting about him is, I think we mentioned this last night on the show, remember last year the Wild played the Bruins twice in four days. Yep. <laughs> and the first one was in yeah. Boston. And before the game, I was talking to the Boston broadcasters and Lauco was on their fourth line. And Jack Edwards said, keep an eye on this kid. He, I don't, I don't remember if he said he didn't make the team out of camp or if he was just had been in and out of the lineup early in the year, but he said, he's got some speed and some energy and he's willing to hit. And sure enough, early in the game, he t- took a couple liberties and it was Connor Dewar who jumped to the teammate defense and dropped the gloves with him. And then four days later, they came to St. Paul Dewey, Dewey and it won. was Brandon Duhame yeah. challenged him and he fought. So he fought twice. He only had like 38 or something penalty minutes last year, yeah. but had 10 in two games with the wild and four days apart. By the way, I just uh, watched the caps devils game from yesterday. Guess who scored twice in the, for the caps last night. Brandon Duhame. Oh, did he? Yeah. Um, I, I just one empty net goal. Well, still, that's yeah. that's a goal. But I, I think it's I like Lauko, what he brings, and I, I think he's an example of what we talked about so often during the off during the summer was that the Wild built their roster and their depth a little differently this year. And you've got some guys who are more suited for the roles that they're expected to play. And I, I like the looks of a fourth line that might have Lauko, Husnadinov, and Freddie Gaudreau on it. That's a it's a very different fourth line than what they had much of last year. Mm-hmm. And the potential to bring yeah, like, a little like, energy, uh, yeah. a, a game, not game changing, but a a momentum changing yeah. kind of line. Like let, Let's be honest, Vinny Letary is not a fourth liner. No. He's a skilled a uh, winger that if he's not in that fourth, you know, in that top six or on a power play, he's just not going to, he's not right. going to give you on the fourth line what most coaches want. Exactly. The and there's and, a lot of guys like Sammy Walker's yeah. that kind of guy. Yeah. His skill set is not, and that's what I kept thinking this summer was last year when it was time to call somebody up from Iowa. Mm-hmm. Those were the players that they had there that were the closest to NHL ready. This year, you've got different guys. And we talked about a couple of them. I mean, who knows exactly what the roster is going to look like, but but you've got guys like Travis, Travis Boyd, Boyd Devin Johnson, Shore, Reese Johnson. Ben you've, Jones. Got, you've got more of a variety of guys that, okay, we need a guy that can be a third line guy or a second line guy, mm-hmm. or now we need a guy to be a fourth line guy. They've got that type of player available to yep. them as a depth guy. I know he took a penalty that I think ended up in a goal last night, but the one guy who I have uh, liked in campus is Brendan Gantz, the former first round pick of the, I think, Blue Jackets can rip the puck. He didn't really show it last night, but, but 
But I, I think a lot of those guys are, are, you know, they're all kind of grouped together because they're all new to us and we probably can't differentiate who's who to what. Um, the one guy that I really have liked in practice and I thought was really good in Winnipeg is Travis Boyd, who I wrote about today. Um, he got top line with, uh, with he got top line with Rossi and, um, and, and Oren yesterday. That line was not great. No, and I didn't think he was great last night. I do think he's been better in camp and I actually think – I liked him in Arizona the last few years. Yeah. I mean, he's, he did score 32 goals yeah. in two full seasons there. And then Average last 36 year, points. Right. Then last year had the season shortened, cut short by in late November. But it was, he finally there got an opportunity to play a fairly regular yeah. shift and probably higher in the lineup than he would ever play mm-hmm. here. Got power play time, but still showed that he has the ability to score in yeah. the national hockey league. And I'd love to see him have it work out for him here. A, a terrific kid. And, you know, great to see anybody from the area get an opportunity to play for their hometown team. Wa- waivers this time of year is pretty strategic. It is going to be interesting when the wild start putting guys on waivers. Cause you can, even if a guy clears, you don't necessarily have to assign him to Iowa. You can just almost do it. Like in a lot of ways, I don't un- sometimes understand why teams don't almost immediately put guys that you, th- that you think are tweeners that might make your team but might not on waivers because because so many teams are, are have so many doors Same open kind of guys yeah that that you also like you don't want to wait for injuries and things like that so it'll be interesting uh, you know I, I could see the wild uh, you know Sunday I think we're going to start seeing guys put on waivers you know Iowa's camp starts next week all that um, but there's obviously always the risk that somebody will claim them but I, mm-hmm. I like your I, I like the point you're making in that at early in camp everybody's got their six or eight right. guys that they signed over the summer. They're not ready to give up on them yeah. yet unless See, there happens to be a guy they were also in on. And now all of a sudden, well, he's on waivers. Let's just yeah. grab him. But I, I think it might be a time where you could sneak players through yeah. that you otherwise like, won't and, be able and one to. Guy, two guys I'm actually thinking of is Reese Johnson and Travis Boyd because these are NHL. Like, you know, they've played a lot of games, very highly respected in that four or five line role. And so, uh, you know, and you just wonder if you could get them through. Um, the good news is if for some reason they did lose one of those guys, they have many others that they signed. Um, so what do you think? Like, like over and said the other day, he hasn't been exactly ecstatic with the start of his camp. Um, he didn't look good last night. Um, if Boldy is healthy, which he sh- we, we think that he's going to be by the start of the season, if the team is healthy, we know who their 12 forwards are because Lauco has cemented his spot already. So, I don't see how Ogren makes a team because I, I also, at least on the opening night roster, because if you're not going to play him on opening night, why would you waste cap space? Like you might as well just start him in Iowa. So I, I could see this team very much keep their 12 forwards until they go on the long road trip and they'll probably want to bring some extra, an extra guy. Um, I, think, I think he's on the outside looking in right now. Unless something changes, I'd say if, if you had to set your roster right now, I agree with that. And I, to me, it's probably more of one of those other depth guys that, it, especially if it's like somebody you have, that you're you going to keep a thirteenth forward. You rather keep a you know a Ben Jones or a, somebody like yeah. that. Keep Reese Johnson as an mm-hmm. extra fourth line guy. It depends on who I think maybe you look at as a a potential penalty kill guy because mm-hmm. even if Boldy comes back, he won't have had penalty kill work throughout camp. And I know that's something they were talking about. I, th- I think the the interesting part will be to see at some point during this camp. Rossi will get a chance to play with Zuccarello and Kaprizov and and see, because I still think even if Ryan Hartman's great and it's better for Ryan Hartman to be between Kaprizov and Zuccarello, and maybe it's even slightly better for Kaprizov and Zuccarello to have Hartman with them. You have to be able to look at it from the overall team perspective and say, but what if your third line was Hartman, Trennan, and Felino? Is that a better shutdown physical mm-hmm. third line than... That now Rossi has to, he's got to have a better performance than he had last night. Because I also have thought the same thing about what if Rossi and Boldy had some chemistry on a second line? Yeah. And you go back to Ek. some form of Ek Felino and like what you had with mm-hmm. Ek Felino and Greenway a couple of years ago. Maybe what about Ek Zuccarello could, and, uh, and, and Kaprizov? You don't like that? Not really. And we haven't seen that line play well in the past, but. You know, I, I like more either. I'm just like, even maybe it's within games or within mm-hmm. stretches of games. I just think it's at some point maybe worth seeing what if Ek Felino and 
Trennan have some of the magic that Eckfelino and Greenway had yeah. a couple of years ago, where they were one of the one of the great third lines in yeah. the NHL. And we'll see another thing the, that John the, Hines yeah. mentioned the other day is he said for what he, and he, it was funny how he said it. He said Rossi and Felino have always seemed to connect well together. And he said, I don't know why I don't see it. Like the eye test doesn't tell me it, but all the analytics say that they play well together. So maybe there's something there too, that, cause in my mind, I'm just looking at it saying, I don't look at Marco Rossi as a shutdown third line centerman. Those other two guys, you kind of think of more of a guy that could be an in your face, a little more grit, little stronger type player. So at some point in this camp, we're going to see Rossi yeah. with some of the scorers. We haven't seen it yet. And and hopefully yet last night, you know, helped Rossi get some of the, the, the bugs out of his game because, you know, where I knew that he really was not in the game was when he had that turnover for the breakaway. I mean, that was just not Marco yeah, Rossi. And he tried to force a goofy two-on-one yeah. pass where instead of just putting a puck on the net, he tried to sneak one through somebody's mm-hmm. skates to Liam Ogren, who was like eight feet away, who was, was never going to be able to do anything anything with the puck, even if it got through. Yeah. So there, there were some goofy decisions made last night too. Um, and the other thing I'll be interested to see is, is, and maybe we'll see it for the game on Friday against uh, Winnipeg is, you know, does Eric Snack and Johansson, if they are aligned together, who takes Boldy's spot? Maybe that's Ryan Hartman. You know, I mean, maybe he's the right wing on that line and they go with Rossi, with Capri Seven Zuccarello, if they're playing tomorrow, we'll, I guess we'll find out uh, by the time this podcast is, um, is, is, is out. Um, Boldy, uh, from everything I've seen with my two eyes at camp, he's got an injury that probably, uh, if we were in season, he'd just be playing through. And uh, right now it makes no sense to have him let, let him heal up. Um, so I don't, this is not like, there were a pu- couple questions on Twitter. Like, is this a concern that like we saw with Spurgeon last year where they were kind of being, you know, sort of, uh, sly all for the first two, three months of the season. This is an actual, just, you know, something happened in practice and he hurt something. Yeah, everything and, that yeah. I've heard, even when it's been on our off the record kind of things is he's, he's going to be fine. Yeah. And so, um, uh, what, what stinks though, is that, you know, he w- he came into camp in unbelievable condition, looked like he was going to have a huge start. Obviously, he still can. And now he's not getting on the ice to get those reps that you need in preparation of a season. And in particular, the PK, because I was excited to see what he looked like on the PK, because Jack Capuano really believes that, you know, high skilled players should be on the PK if they can handle that. Um, he pointed to guys like Zabinijad and Kreider and right. Trocek and Barkov and Ryan Hart and Marchand and when Bergeron was there. And so he just really believes that you know, in 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 Ottawa, he had guys like Stutzla and those guys on the on the Claude Giroux. And I remember talking to Dean about that last year, early in the season, when they were quite literally willing to try anything to get the penalty kill figured out. And I just asked him about his reservation because the, the Wild had some guys. Boldy was one that have unbelievable hands. Zuccarello has mm-hmm. a great stick and reach. And Dean had just said that he was worried about how much tread was on the tires of some of these guys right. because of the fact that they weren't the most gifted scoring team to begin with. So if you're leaning on these guys for 20, 21 minutes, 22 minutes, sometimes in a game anyway, do you really want to add another Three two minutes, minutes of penalty kill time? But the one thing he said is we've talked about it because there's something to be said for having a guy with great hands to number one, break up passes. How about a guy who can win a, puck battle along the wall with his hands. How many times do we see Boldy do that in the offensive zone and just has the skill to make a play to get rid of the puck, get the puck out of the zone once it's on your stick. And the reason we brought it up was I I don't remember the game, but the night before or the game before they, it was one of those games where they had four or five chances with the puck on their stick and didn't get the clear. And it was fourth line guys trying to make a play to get the puck out of the zone. And, it started me thinking if that pucks on Matt Zuccarello's stick, it ends up at the other end of the rink. If it's yeah. on Matt Boldy's stick, it ends up at the other end. And what about Karel Kaprizov? I would love to see that one day. I, don't I mean, know. I, I, the, 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 to me, what's interesting about putting guys like Kaprizov on the power play is, is, you know, he, they Penalty play kill. 140 on the power play. So it's like, if all of a sudden they're on the PK to your point, you know, they are, they're playing heavy minutes and we have seen skilled players significant, you know, block shots and break feet and things like that. We saw that with, with, uh, with Zach Parisi here playing on the PK. I think it was Alex Steen that got him in St. Louis. And didn't Eric uh, Sinek do the same yeah, thing? Um, we saw Miko Koivu break his foot. I think Nicholas Backstrom got him on a, on a PK. So, I mean, it happens. And that, 
would be the what the big danger is like all of a sudden you have Kaprizov out there killing a penalty when you could be using Murat Husandinov or Jakob Lauko or Freddie Goudreau and next thing you know Kaprizov's out because of that. So uh, it doesn't seem worth it, but you look at you know how good guys like Zibanejad and Kreider and right. you know Trocheck and, and there is something to be said for some of those guys always, are centers, but you can't always play scared of injury either. Right, like it, you could just as easily yeah. block a shot five on five yeah. and wind up on the injured list. So you're not going to tell those guys to stay out of shooting lanes for fear of injury. I mean, there's one way to play the game, and that's to play it. And yes, some guys break their feet, but a lot of guys don't. So it just, I think it's more the minutes and that we've talked about the the lineup for Minnesota. The beauty of it this year is you might be able to take some of those minutes off because it's a little bit of a deeper group. But there are – the willingness to put a skilled guy on the penalty kill probably outweighs that when you start to look at – got to try anything when you're seven, killing seven out of ten because you can't win with that. Right. Let's take a quick break. When it comes to great stakes, it's all about the marbling. And there's a one through 12 scale for marbling that will – measure what the quality is of the steak and for fellers ranch wagyu it's some of the best you'll find they won't sell their steaks unless they're at a marbling level of six to ten on a scale of 12 it's some of the best steaks you'll find just for reference usda prime can be called usda prime as long as it's at three or four on that same scale this steak is some of the best i've had you can find it at fellersranch.com their vans are in the cities every week they can deliver it to you there are also a couple of spots within the cities where you can pick it up you won't be disappointed if you're having a great meal and you want to have steak, there's no place to go that's better than Feller's Ranch. We do want to thank Twilt and the Dining Galleria. I don't know if you've been to the Dining Galleria. It's a beautiful place to shop, a very comfortable place to shop, easy parking, easy in and out, really good restaurants there uh, to hang out in if you want to do that. But if you walk by Twilt, you'll see that the shop reflects their products. Uh, it's a very down-to-earth, easygoing, uh, attractive space. Uh, with with ver- with expert uh, associates working there who are not pushy at all. They're just there to answer your questions and, and help steer you in the right direction if you need steering. Uh, and you go in there and just walk by, get a look, and then go back when you when you want to buy clothes for yourself, when you buy somebody a present, whatever the case might be. Go in and realize that Scott Dayton handpicks everything in his shop. Scott Dayton's the proprietor. It is twilled by Scott Dayton. Scott's been a friend of mine and has been supporting this network for a long time. I buy all of my clothes there. My wife loves the place. Uh, every time we go in there, we buy more than we expected to, to buy because my wife likes it so much. Their stuff fits. It wears well. I just went on a European vacation where everything I wore was from Twilby's at you get out of an eight hour flight and you're not even wrinkled. The stuff just wears well. You can buy everything from golf you know, from running shoes, walking shoes, golf shorts to beautiful Italian suits that you can wear anywhere, uh, you know, to any occasion. So just check out twillmn.com, sign up for their email notifications. They will not spam you. They'll just send you something if they're going to have a special event. Back here, Worst Seats in the House, Michael Russo, Anthony LaPanta, final segment of the show, uh, October 2nd, next Wednesday night, our next live show at LC's at 7 p.m., October 30th at uh, Split Rocks. Um, how excited are you for the start of the season? I'm, I'm, I'm at that point at camp where I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited. It was, it was great to go down to Dallas and do the game the other night just to call a game again, shake the rust off, just to be in the building, even though it's an exhibition game and the crowd was only a fraction of what it would be like, just to have that atmosphere again and be back in it was cool. It was exciting. And yeah, I'm ready to get going. I I still have a couple Twins games this weekend. I've got the Orioles series to close the season, but my brain is on to hockey now and it's just fun to start to think about the even just even the simplest thing of starting to go back to revisit the websites that I use for tracking stats or looking up information. That takes a little time just to get yourself back in the flow of, mm-hmm. OK, if I'm trying to find this, was that a natural statric? page? Was that NHL media page? Was that sport radar page? Was that money puck? The, all the different sites that I use to f- that are all good for something, 
just to go back and find it was fun to start digging around again. And okay, that's right. I could search it this way. I can search it that way. Here's here. I can find it fast while Wes is in mid sentence so that I can support him. And just to, to get back into that mindset, I'm excited. Right. Uh, let's go to some Twitter questions. Carter Wetmore goes, what traditions do you have for your fantasy hockey league draft? Do we have any traditions? Well, we have the donkey cup, which is a coveted trophy. And we do have, we print banners for the teams that won the previous year that they get to hang at their table. We have the draft signs of to make it look like you're at a draft table where everybody's got their sign. Not really. A, I don't think it's not like we have a tradition where the, the last the loser place has team, to go right, do some. We, we actually talked about it. We did do something last year and I will, it's, we won't say it on the air here, but the team that loses the, the, the jackass of the year series has a penalty. So we've got that. We did decide last year there's a penalty for anybody who calls up a player that's already been assigned to a team. Right. That, that was to buy around. So that was, that'll, that's a tradition that we have. Right. Um, all right. Uh, OC Wild Boys 59 goes thoughts on the Cider and Raymond extensions, both a little under Larkin. Uh, Raymond got eight years at hefty. Mo- I'm not sold on Raymond as a player, but we'll see. Cider, I love. I mean, that is a great contract. Seven years at below Larkin's number, which is about eight, seven. Um, yeah, pretty good contract for that kid. Yeah, Cider, I, where would you put, where, how would you compare Cider to Brock Favor? See, I don't, I don't watch a lot of them. He's much more physical. Um, that, that would be the one big thing. Um, so, but again, I don't, I can't say that I, you know, I'm watching a lot of Detroit Red Wings as, as Red Wings fans that are listening to this might tell me because I, uh, the year that Cider won the Calder, I don't think he was on my ballot. Um, or he wasn't at least in the top three. I think Cider has some offensive skill too. I, he's a good player. And when, you, when you, I, uh, j- just one thing, the reason why he wasn't on my ballot that year, we saw him play two games against Minnesota and he was horrific. Remember that? I Those remember games. the game yeah. in Detroit. Yeah. It was not good, but I've always liked him as a player. I, to me, it's as long as his number was in the ballpark of favor, it probably tells you mm-hmm. both for both teams, they were decent deals. Raymond is an interesting one because I wasn't as sold on him until we saw him head to head against the wild this year. And it was just the opposite where all of a sudden I was like, Whoa, this guy's a better player than I remembered him being. And maybe he just took another step in his development, but I like the way the Red Wings are headed. Oh yeah. And he's a part of that. I agree. Uh, remember that what was it two, three years ago when Dumba got him in front of the net. It was gruesome. Remember that? Just How about watching Matt Dumba last night? Yeah. Take and, the, uh, big well, hit on Devin took the Shore. big hit, but I was thinking more about the, Matt Dumba esque turnovers all night long. <laughs> that just as the, every one that happened, you'd I'd look at Wes and he'd be throwing up his arms like I'm so glad he's I'm not watching that turnover for us anymore. And that's I could just read Wes's mind, but it you know he's he's <laughs> if Wes is listening, he's like he's probably thinking to himself, thanks Anthony, no, but <laughs> Appreciate I mean, it. he's but he's Matt Dumba like he also is on the score sheet, he mm-hmm. delivers the big hit. The Wild missed him when he left just for those kind of things. He, They didn't have that guy that delivered a big hit, even if he went out of his way to do it, put himself in a bad spot, but changed the momentum of a game. All of those things brought value, but you also, with that, got four or five turnovers every yep. single night and a f- couple of them in really bad spots at the offensive blue line. Uh, Budman asks, uh, do you see any possibility of Merrill going through waivers and ends up in Iowa? I mean, it's definitely an option. They would save about 400 grand. Uh, well, the, the reason why I say 400 grand is technically you could bury his uh, 1.15 million of his one, two. So it does make all the sense in the world. But if you do that, you're going to have an extra defenseman that's probably making 775. So you're basically saving 400 grand to do that. Um, Damon Hunt has looked great in camp. He looked awesome in Winnipeg. We didn't see him last night in Dallas. Um, he's definitely putting pressure on him. I think he's ready. I think he's NHL ready, but you also don't want him just sitting in the press box. Right. And right now you're, you're playing Chisholm and, and, um, and, and Bogosian. Bogosian. the one thing I'll say is, is Jake Middleton's wife is due at some point on that seven game road trip. So there's a chance that Middleton's going to leave. So you're going to want somebody playing for Middleton. And would you want Johnny Merrill or would you want Damon Hunt? I think that's the type of thing that yeah, they are I don't, have to think about. I don't think there's, I, just a guess, I don't think there's any way they would put him on waivers before the season starts. Mm-hmm. I think you start the season with him as your seventh. Damon Hunt, it's okay to start in Iowa. And if Middleton if, leaves. If you end up with a significant injury where you need somebody for three weeks, mm-hmm. you bring Hunt back. If Middleton leaves and it's to miss a game or two games, 
you could slide Johnny Merrill in there for a couple of games. But then I think, let's say Hunt goes down and has a great start in Iowa. And now you'd say, all right, we'd rather have him be up here as our seventh guy. Maybe he's in and out of the lineup every once in a while. But I think you're right that if he's going to be the seventh and sit on the sidelines all the time, that doesn't do him any good. Right. Um, we're going to get, uh, I got a ton of questions about Kaprizov and all the Chicago talk this week. We'll get to that. I promise before the show ends, we're saving the best for last. Um, Tyler asked on a scale of one to 10, how annoyed you with your tweets so far, Mike? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm okay so far. Um, Anthony, what's your go-to pregame meal? You're usually like a protein shake guy, aren't you? I am. It depends. It, it, I'm a very much a routine guy. So a lot of fruit. I, I, there is a lot of fruit and home games. I leave the rink, I go print my lineup cards, I go to Lifetime, I get a protein shake, then I come back to the rink at 3, I'm in the press box by 3.40 every single day, get my work done, and then it's whatever they're eating at Excel. But a lot of the road cities, I don't eat at the arena. There's only a few where I do. Any of them that I can walk to the rink, almost every single one of those I go eat somewhere else. So it just depends on the city. There isn't one meal that I eat, but a lot of them, if there's a good protein shake spot, I'll get a protein shake on my way back to the rink and then I'll wait and eat on the airplane when we're leaving to head to the next city. But there are a few where I'll eat at the rink. Dallas is usually one of them. They have a decent uh, media meal and it was Detroit. It was good last night. Detroit, I... I eat there sometimes. It's like a Vegas Not, buffet. It's kind of like a Vegas buffet. Exactly. So sometimes there's one part that might be okay, <laughs> but that's an example of a city where I'll often just I'll go get a protein shake and then I'll wait and eat on the airplane on the way to wherever we're going. Yep. Uh, hockey goon. Um, and by the way, I'm the same way. There's like, well, I'm actually more the opposite where there's just five arenas where I know the meal I would never eat there. So I, that's where I know that I'll eat on the way to the game uh, where other places I'll just eat. Yeah, and the there's game. some where there, where we have to ride a bus to the game. So there isn't really an option. And like Chicago is one of those and Chicago's meal is usually decent. Right. You have to wait in line for about, yeah, but you're not hour. walking to the, United I'm not Center. walking to the game. So <laughs> therefore I'll ride Ottawa. the bus. Yeah. Ottawa is the same way. Although in Ottawa, I often will grab a little like, they have protein shakes at that little cafe in the hotel where we stay. Yeah. So often I'll grab one there and then, because the meal in Ottawa is so terrible yeah. that I'll just go to the game and yeah. figure I'll wait till we're on the airplane leaving. Yeah, Ottawa is a place you don't want to eat in the pregame room. This sounds like an athletic article. You know what's so funny about that is that people would actually find that kind of interesting. Like, you know, rate the press rooms at every, th- yeah, at I all 32 arenas. people ask me that a lot. And, yeah. and I always tell them, you got to talk to Gorgie. LA is good. You got to talk to Gorgie because he yeah. eats all of them and I don't. So they're, LA is usually pretty good. And... I'm trying to think of others where we ride the bus. Tampa's is it, good. Carolina is where we ride the bus, and it's not bad yeah. there usually. Yeah. It's usually the same thing, though. It's almost it's always barbecue <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. You're right. It's like barbecue pork or something. Um, Joe asked our, our uh, uh, player height and weight officially recorded on day one of camp, or do the players simply say their measurements, or do, uh, does the team simply use last year's numbers? Uh, they are updated. I don't know if, like, in – in training camp rosters and how they do that. But I can tell you that players um, during a season are constantly, they, they, I think there's at least the way it used to be. There's like literally a scale right by where they walk in and they chart it almost, almost weekly or daily. Even Um, they're constantly uh, paying attention to that. They just don't give it to us. Um, We talked about Riley height. Uh, We talked about the prospects standing out. Uh, Wild Boy is another good question. Uh, thoughts on the Cole Perfetti extension and two, two-year bridge in the 3-2 range. That's probably Marco Rossi's, you know, comparable uh, if you're his agent next year. And I don't know if Bill Guerin's ready to do something like that. We'll no, see. but it's funny how the bridge deals have diminished lately. There's so many guys who their first contract is those max seven, eight-year deals. Yeah. And where we used to see almost everybody sign some kind of bridge deal. Mm-hmm. It sure seems like teams have gone away from that, but I think Rossi seems like a likely candidate for more yeah. of a bridge type. It deal. is interesting. Like Rossi, because he missed, he's still on his entry level contract and everybody else has either been up, but you know, Jarvis got an extension and Lindell got an extension, but then Holloway got a new contract on the offer sheet from St. Louis Perfetti. Um, I think there's somebody else I'm missing as well. 
Um, but, you know, Rossi is the only one that we're still not sure. And he was drafted higher than all those guys. Pretty interesting. But missed most of a year. Yep. And I think it's, to me, he still seems like a guy that if I were the Wild, I'd want to see this year before mm-hmm. I decide what which, which direction I want to go. And, you know, it, that can backfire on you if all of a sudden right. he goes out and has a great year. But that's that's how I'd be approaching it if I were the Wild. Um, Drew Thorson uh, says, uh, would love to have this answer. My wife and I are going to Anaheim and L.A. games in, in December. Any places LaPanta recommends for food in L.A. and Anaheim? Ooh. Anaheim's tough. Anaheim's tough. Depends on where you stay. Yeah. If you stay out by that mall, Mastro's is right down there. Right. I forget the name of that mall. Coast Mall. Yeah, or something. Costa Mesa. Is it's, that in what it's, Co- it's in Costa Mesa. And 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 that place next to the Westin. That's uh, it's like a big white restaurant next to the Westin. That's pretty good. Right next to it. Yeah, I don't think I've eaten there. That's right, but the corner. Mastro's out there is terrific. I don't really. I'm not a big fan of any. It's mostly chain yeah. places around. If you go there. to Newport Beach. I like There's, the winery. The winery's decent. I'd say the wine's good, but it's overpriced. The food I thought was average one time, and then I'd say above average the other time that we were there. I don't even remember what we had, but I know the first time I walked away thinking, I'm not sure I'd eat here again. Was it you and I that were we were sitting at the bar once, and like half the ducks were around us. Yeah, like, well, like all at the bar. there were a fair. Yeah. We we've been out there a couple times. Yeah. Um, the L.A. area again. I'd leave. The, we, we stay down right by the rink in the mm-hmm. L.A. library, and there's nothing there except chain restaurants that are lousy. But when we were out in Santa Monica, there were a couple of good spots. You mentioned one of them already. Yeah, Scopa. 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 That was pretty good. And there was that little... That's, I think, technically Marina Del Rey. That's right, Marina Del Rey. But we, where did we go in Santa Monica that wasn't too bad? Oh, yeah, the fish place the night that I got into the car crash. Right. That That, that night the woman hit me. Yeah. Remember that? Well, you cut her off. No, I did not cut her off, Anthony. (laughs) You smashed right into her. She smashed into me, (laughs) Anthony. You smashed into her. You you wrecked uh, Margo's door so she couldn't get out of the car. We don't need to go back and talk about that one. Um, In Beverly Hills area, I mean, always the polo lounge is fun, which is uh, going to the Beverly Hills Hotel. There's Nobu out there. There's another great, great Mastro's. A lot of good places in Beverly Hills. Oh, man, do we sound privileged. Um, <laughs> Lucky. Hideki, we've talked about Lauco. Um, all right, let's get it to the... Uh, here, one more on the favorite. What's your favorite road, uh, road City game you're most looking forward to this this season? And then we'll talk about Caprizo. Well, this one I had asked of me a lot of times on the golf trip I just was on in Brainerd where guys were asking about cities. And we had a few of those guys who have, took a couple trips with me last year or two years ago. But for me... My favorite city for dinner and wine is Montreal. The, oh, I love old Montreal. I love the spots down there. My favorite cities for just kind of the overall experience are the eastern U.S. cities. I love going to Boston, New York, Philly, Washington. I love the history in those cities. Love seeing the museums, monuments, et cetera, in each one of those spots. But Montreal is probably the one. The only problem with Montreal this year Back is, to back, right? It's a back to back. We are staying in Montreal after the game, so we we. But that's not really like a night to go have dinner in Montreal. It's because we won't be done with the game until nine nine thirty, and at least we do get to stay there to. We'll go down and have some drinks somewhere down in old Montreal, but we're not. We don't get a night off there for dinner. So based on our schedule. I'm kind of excited about the trip down to Fort Lauderdale where we get a couple of days in Fort Lauderdale after a game in Columbus, go down there two days before we play the Panthers. Yeah. It's always a great spot. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I always look out forward to the California trips and things like that. I, mean, um, I love going to Vegas, yeah. but the, we're back to back, second yeah. back to back. I'm not there. on that trip. I'm on the seven gamer. Got to go to the Angus barn. Looking forward to that trip to Raleigh. I think That'll I might skip the Angus barn. No, you're not. You're going to the Angus barn. Some cheese whiz before yeah. dinner. No, no. Uh, you're definitely going to that. All right. Let's talk about Kaprizov. Obviously, look, we're going to be talking about Kaprizov until they sign him, right? I mean, that's just going to be, it's going to be a constant topic of conversation for, uh, it's not just Minnesota and people being conditioned to fret things. I mean, the same thing just happened in Edmonton for a couple of years with Dry's Idol, because in a lot of ways it also might have affected McDavid. And I think the Dry's Idol signing means McDavid's going to eventually sign. Um, and Kaprizov can't be signed until next July 1 or thereafter. Um, but because of that, there are teams out there that are 
sitting there and eyeballing, Hey, he's like all teams do like the wild are even doing like in this year that these guys are available on this guy this year. And so there are teams out there that have a ton of cap space that are saying, Hey, in two years of Caprice house available, he's the guy we're going to go after. I do. And I've said it on this pod a couple of times. I think Chicago, it makes a lot of sense for him. Mark Lazarus this week on the athletic hockey show uh, took it a little step further, but he uh, has since clarified and, and said he misspoke. And I tr- truly believe that he did misspoke. And I'll tell you why in a second, but he basically said on the athlete in the athletic show that a lot of different sources told him at the NHL draft at the sphere, um, both affiliated with the Blackhawks and without that Kaprizov was wanting to play with the Chicago Blackhawks. Um, I knew when he even said that and I started to hear it that he had to get hit, get, almost either forget what he reported or just got it confused a bit. And that happens to me too. Sometimes you report something months earlier and you sort of flip it or you forget exactly what you have. And it's just in your, we write so much stuff that it's just, it, it's, you, you sometimes get confused. And the reason why I knew that he got that flipped is that night, the day that he wrote that, I actually coincidentally walked back from the sphere to the Westin with him and I believe Kevin Kurz, um, who's our Philadelphia Flyers writer. And he told me that, hey, just so you know, I, I threw this and and it was it was such a nut, you know, a far off thing that it's just something I buried in my story that the Blackhawks were gonna be looking at him in a couple of years. I'm like, all right, thanks for telling me. And then he said said it the opposite the other day. Then, of course, it gets aggregated by a lot of different people. Um, Joe Smith, my podcast, my my athletic uh, colleague, his podcast partner, State of Hoppy, put out the vi- the audio. So then Bleacher Report picked it up and was picked by everywhere. They turned it into memes. And, and then, um, and then uh, Mark, thankfully, clarified. Um, but look, I don't think any Wild fans, like whether Mark is right or wrong, he might eventually be right. I mean, it makes all the sense in the world that the Blackhawks are going to go after him. I truly believe that he has sources that have said to him, the Blackhawks are going to go after him. They have a number one center there. Um, you know, if you remember my, uh, my, uh, wild player poll that I ran last February or March, uh, the favorite road city was the first thing that Caprice have said, love Chicago, love any place, you, any big city like Vegas or New York places you could walk around and go to a nice meal. So, I mean, this stuff is going to be out there until he signs. And I just think that wild fans just need to understand that, that, that this is why we are, it is true that this season is big. This, this franchise is at a crossroads. They have to show him that he can win here because there's 31 other teams that would love to have him, And there's 31 other great markets as well. Well, that's true. But the only thing I would say is that every team would love to have Kirill Kaprizov. Right. So to say that Chicago would have interest in him two years from now, well, so would every other team in the NHL. Mm-hmm. So that's not news. Right. It just isn't. And the fact that Kaprizov said he loves Chicago when asked about his favorite road city does not mean he's about to sign with the Chicago Blackhawks. Right. Who doesn't love Chicago? Right. I love Chicago. I love Montreal. Yeah. It's not like I'm saying Remember that. Remember you once had a huge bill there that was tweeted that Margo really got pissed at. I did. It was just a typical dinner on the road. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, I just, I think that there's, I think there's a little irresponsibility with how it's even shoved into a story because it's not news. It's not fact. Yep. Nobody knows if Kirill Kaprizov has had any conversations with anybody of any substance about potentially signing with right. the Chicago Blackhawks. And, and, and that's the big thing here is that there's no, like sh- from a Kirill Kaprizov standpoint, nobody, unless you're Zuccarello probably, um, there's nobody that knows anything. Um, you know, and, and like, he's not going out and telling, there's no reporter that's super close with him. He's like, Hey, Hey, wink, wink. He's no, you know, people in the league, right. but that's the thing. I mean, you're talking about an incredibly talented star that uh, has a lot of friends in the league. And, um, and that's the concern is that you don't know from that standpoint, like what, you know, if Kucherov, yeah, you know, Tampa's not bad. Panarin's, you know, or New York's not bad. Right. Like, but, and all and that, that's the thing. all of that could be happening, right? but none of it is Fact right. right now, and none of it is news. Right. So I think it's like to me, why put it in your story? Right. Why even say that there's no question Chicago? Well, so would Vegas. Yeah. You don't think Vegas would be interested in Kirill Kaprizov? How about the Rangers? You think they'd be interested in him in two years? Well, of course they would. Every team would. So and and just uh, you know, again, from my colleagues, uh, who, and I, uh, I like who I, Mark yeah, a yeah, lot. And I respect him a lot as and a writer. He's awesome. He's a good friend of mine too. Great at what he does. Tremendous writer never makes a typo, which pisses me the most off about him. Um, but, but, you know, to, to his 
thing too is that it was such a nothing thing that he intentionally just buried it. He didn't make it a headline. He didn't tweet it. He didn't tout it. It was, and then what happens is sometimes, and the reality is sometimes you do get confused and he, he'll gladly admit that. But sometimes I will say, none of us are professional, like you're a professional broadcaster. We're not, we're sports writers. And sometimes you put a microphone in front of us and we just blab and we say things and you think you're talking into the ether. And next thing you know, you're aggregated by some, you know, some, some other site. You know, I, it happens to me all the time on K on the fan. I'll just say something. And next thing you know, it's an actual article on like min, min news or whatever, um, or whatever they're called. Um, you know, uh, so I mean, you know, or blogs or things like that. So sometimes we just say things thinking that nobody is listening listening when the reality is, I think this is a good learning lesson. And Mark and I have talked about it. It's a good learning lesson for all of us to one, remember that people actually are listening and that there's definitely people listening because they are the clickbait people. They're the ones that want to just throw out a tweet with a big me and that's a yeah. quote out yeah. of context. And that's why you have to be so careful. Yep. And it's, there have been a number of broadcasters who have gotten yep. in trouble by making a side comment somewhere else. And then all of a sudden it gets repeated. It gets reposted. It yeah. gets redistributed. And before you know it, it's, he said this, well, he was talking about something totally unrelated, mm -hmm. but yes, he did say it. If you clip the beginning and the end off, that statement was fact, but it, it's taken yeah. him. You have, just have to be really careful. Yeah. And uh, so again, the moral of the story though, from a listener standpoint of everybody listening, the real thing is that until Kaprizov signs, which isn't for a year, you just got to accept that, that this is just the reality is, is that and every time he goes and has a great dinner somewhere and said, boy, I love coming to New York. Oh, it could be going to New York. Lots of great know. Russian restaurants right. in New York. Joe Smith wrote about one of them that Kaprizov went to with Jake Middleton. Um, so uh, I think it's a good show, but I, I do, I do just think that, um, that, that this to get to the back to the point though, Anthony, is that this is this season is a huge one because I think also not even from a Kaprizov standpoint, um, and I'm going to be doing a story about this in about nine days, a, a big story on sort of a little history lesson of the wild and then the now of what's coming up is that Bill Guerin bought himself four years with those buyouts. This is the last year of the big chunk of those buyouts. And now he has committed to a lot of the guys that you and I have talked about for a long time. So if those guys don't have the good years and this team continues to be sort of in the middle, um, I think the pressure ratchets up pretty quick uh, for this organization. I just think that they are at a crossroads because they've set this plan to come out of four years after the buyouts to be ready to hit the ground running. And Bill, and Bill Guerin has said it and Craig Leopold has said it multiple times. And we're getting with him again Tuesday night to talk to him. And they, they you know, in Craig Craig Leopold's mind, he expects that starting next year, they are, boom, going to start to be a contender. And we've heard about these prospects, and we've we've obviously signed the long-term core of this deal, uh, if you're Bill Guerin, and now they've got to actually put up uh, or shut up, or, or it's going to be yeah, no, you know, I mean, I've a lot of questions. I've, I've said the same thing every time we've talked about it, that I think we won't know if the plan works until the 25, 26 season. Mm -hmm. And if in 25, 26, the wild are not a contender and we've defined contender to me, it's if you're not poised to be one of when people say who are the top four teams in the West, the wild should be one of those four. And if, if they're not that, then I don't know if the plan can be deemed a success, but we'll see. Yep. Uh, good, good end of the show again, October 2nd, next Wednesday night at Elsie's. Uh, at 7 p.m. October 30th at Split Rocks. Thanks for joining us from the Aquarius Home Services studio. Thanks to our incredible sponsors, Aquarius Home Services, your local authorized dealer for Connecticut Water Treatment Systems, Royal Credit Union, and Twill in the Edina Galleria. Talk to you next Wednesday night, everybody.